This is a podcast from Minute Media. Hello, and welcome to the Over and Back Classic NBA Podcast. I am Jason, and with me as usual is Rich. Hello, Rich. Hey, what's going on, Jason? Oh, you know, just uh, unfortunately, um, we have some sad news in the NBA world. Uh, Sam Jones, the Celtics legend, has passed away at age 88. Uh, just, you know, one of the great, you know, one of the, one of the great players in that Celtics dynasty, you know, 10 championship rings during his career, second only to Bill Russell, just, uh, you know, amazing player, you know, really, um, really interesting guy. Uh, definitely a sad loss for the NBA world. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. A guy that um, kind of felt eternal in a lot of ways. Like you, you didn't, you, you always know that like we're coming up on a lot of these guys, you know, getting into their later eight, you know, ages, the, you know, the top, top tier Celtics guys, the MVPs, we've always talked about how there's only, you know, two MVPs that have ever passed away. It's going to unfortunately start happening a lot more uh, in, in the coming years. And for some reason, Sam Jones just felt like a guy. I don't know why. Like, I, it, it it just felt like there was he wasn't going to die anytime soon. It felt like he it seemed like relatively healthy. And then I remember about, I want to say six or seven months ago, reading an article that said that he was, you know, starting to, you know, really deteriorate a little bit. He stopped playing golf, started to kind of slow down in his life. And that was when I was like, oh, man, that, that stinks. Because yeah. you heard that, like, he was still into, you know, his mid eighties still doing like celebrity golf tournaments and still, you know, sure. out and yeah. about and, 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 and with it and, and, and solid. And that's, and that's all you can really ask for is be in your mid eighties and still be able to do, you know, the things you love. And, uh, yeah, I remember reading that article about, I, I want to say it was about six or seven months ago that said, yeah, he had to give up golf and he had started right. to slow down a little bit. And it was like, oh, no, yeah, man. But, uh, you know what? Hey, let a, let a pretty awesome life, all things considered. We can all hope to lead a Sam Jones life if we, oh, absolutely. If we can. So. Yeah, we just need to put Bill Russell in a protective bubble, you know, at all times. I know we sure. can't lose yeah. Bill. We really can't. Yeah. I don't we know just, what that, we're gonna that's do. Gonna be yeah. hard. That's I don't the, know what we're gonna do. That's essentially who I was alluding to there. Of like, right. we can't lose sure. Bill. We can't. And he like right. he seems fine, but like, yeah, when you get to that age, it's right. like you know, yeah, any, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, anything can happen. Yeah, I, it's. I, I mean, you know, the Celtics in particular have lost so many guys recently. I mean, obviously Heinsohn and Casey Jones, you know, within the last year or so and Havlicek, you know, just a couple, um, you know, two, three years ago, I think. So, um, yeah, a lot of really important guys uh, from those years, uh, unfortunately, uh, passing on. But yeah, we've got um, some great, uh, you yeah, some interesting stories to talk about with Sam Jones and talk about some of his accomplishments. We picked 10 games out of his career that kind of tell the story um, of his career. So it should be some fun stuff to dive into. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and this is a guy who I think if if you listen to this podcast or you've ever listened to the Over and Back podcast, we are we are Sam Jones respecters because there's a sure. lot of people that probably don't realize how important that guy was to the Celtics and don't realize that he wasn't just one of the Joneses. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, right. it, it's yeah. You know, Casey's great. Casey is really really good. Sam is is you know a little more important than Casey Jones was uh, to a lot of those teams and and arguably like and we're going to try to do a good job of, or, or or we will try to do a job of I should say uh, over the next uh, hour or so. Uh, to let you know just how important he was to those Celtics teams and just how important he was to those teams winning those titles. Not just a guy who was along for the ride with Bill Russell, like a guy who who very much so played played huge, huge roles in, in them winning those titles. Yeah, and the Celtics were obviously a true team. I mean, Russell was the most important player by far. That, the very, that That's very clear. But And there were a lot of guys who contributed over you know that 13-year span of that dynasty. Uh, and, you know, get Sam Jones was there pretty much the whole way. Uh, and he was known as the Celtic who would uh, take the big shot when yep. needed. You know, he had so many big shots in, in the postseason. He, you know, earned the name uh, Mr. Clutch, which somebody took from him, which is weird. Uh, you know, the the guy who's best known for his team's losing all the I was going to say, well, unfortunately. Mr. Clutch. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't yeah. know how that – well, I, yeah. I have a note about that later because, yeah, right. we're going to talk about Sam Jones and, and the sure. Celtics beating Mr. Well, Clutch and the Lakers right. like every well, time. All right. Well, them, I'll, so. I'll save my rant for that point. But, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Yep, Mr. Clutch. But anyway um, – yeah, and if you look at his career numbers, you know they're they're good, but not necessarily you know spectacular. Um, you know he's averaged about seventeen you know points per game throughout his career. Um, you know the the, the counting stats, uh, you know four point nine rebounds, two point five assists. You know um, almost a nineteen per. You know again, um, really solid career. You know uh, you know a, a a Hall of Fame career, but not necessarily 
you know, a guy you would look at and and say, oh yeah, he was an upper tier player, you know, one of the 50 or 75 or whatever greatest of all time. But yeah, you look at really how he contributed and, and especially, you know, during those big game situations, um, you know, really, you can see how essentially important he was um, to those teams, um, you know, pretty much throughout the entire time. So just, yeah, some overall accomplishments, um, five time all-star three times, all NBA on the second team, you know, he's behind West and, um, and Oscar Robertson and, uh, you know, Bob Cousy and Bill Sharman, you know, uh, on his own team, as much in terms of being those all NBA accomplishments, but, you know, got a few in the mid sixties. He was on the 25th, 50th and 75th anniversary team. That, that 25th uh, anniversary team being on that team, that was a, uh, that, you know, he was definitely a bit of a, a a slight surprise in terms because that's you know the greatest um, players of the, of the first twenty five years and a lot of the he kind of went ahead of some of the older players who had maybe more accomplishments. But that kind of shows how respected he was. That that happened you know right after he retired. Kind of showed you know, how he was how respected he was at the time of his retirement. And then sort of you know as 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 memories went on, kind of got you know forgotten a little bit in the in the midst of spites. You know the certainly the. 60s Celtics, not any lack of, um, you know, people who really, you know, emphasize those teams, but somehow, you know, kind of became underrated despite that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Being on that 25th team, I think is, is, is just huge, huge accomplishment. Cause yeah, like you said, the, the guys that he's over, there's a lot of spectacular guys. There's a lot of guys with like really eye popping numbers and, 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 you know, solid amounts of accomplishments. But yeah, for him to be on there immediately after he retires, let, yeah, right. it, it lets you know that, right. like, you know, now we, yeah. we sort of look at the 60 Celtics as, like, Bill Russell and then, like, this amazing team and this amazing collection of talent where, you know, maybe then they were like, no, I mean, Sam Jones is a big, damn good player and a big reason why uh, that team won. And, uh, yeah, like, right. you, you're absolutely right that over the years we've sort of – we've turned them into this one blob of, you know, Bill Russell, Bob Cousy, John Havlicek, and then a bunch of these dudes who were just really, really good ba- basketball players and all could, you know, work around those top stars or whatever. And it's like, no, let's let's give some respect to some of these guys, including sure. Sam Jones, who, who, yeah, I think being on that 2015 tells you at that time just how respected and how uh, revered he was. Right. It would want 12 guys to be on that team. So that it's a small. Yeah. Team, it's not a big team. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's right. not, there's exactly. not 76 guys like we had in 70. Sure. It's, sure. it's, it's, it's a small little team here. We're talking about the best of the best. And it's like they right. made a team. They made like one lineup. They didn't make like, you know, hey, let's list, you know, 50, 75 guys or whatever. It was literally 12 dudes. So, yeah. Well, and it just shows like how well they blended in together sometimes obscures how great they were individually. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and, and absolutely. So, yeah. And, um, yeah, uh, Mike Lynch, uh, good friend Mike Lynch shared, um, that Sam Jones 25 and two all time in playoff series uh, during his career, which is just like, you know, and, and, and honestly, the, the, the first loss came, you know, when he was a rookie. So really um, outside of that, you know, 25 and one only losing to the 76, uh, 67, 76 years. So um, it was a really good article on uh, basketball scholar um, looking at kind of his, you know, kind of his clutch performance. And it brings up, he was the scoring leader for the Celtics five times during the regular season, three times during the postseason. Um, and um, he averaged 27.1 points per game in nine career playoff game sevens. Um, his playoff scoring average, 18.9, exceeded his regular season output, 17.7. But if you look at his playoff scoring average uh, during his years as a starter from 1962 on, uh, 22.6 points per game. So, And, and again, you know, the, Cel- the Celtics were a very balanced team. There were not a lot of, you know, uh, no one averaged 30 points per game during, um, during that era. You know, guys really barely even averaged 25 points per game. So they were really... Um, you know, built on, on a lot of things. So for him to stand out in that way is um, pretty exceptional. He was nine and zero during his career in seventh games in playoff series. Uh, again, averaged twenty seven point one points per game in those series. So that's just you know, yeah. right there. Oh, you know, yeah. And, and some of these are nuts. We had uh, our, our good friend Curtis Harris uh, who, who tweeted this out. A couple he, he linked. We we have a, a on uh, Overback NBA. On Twitter, we you know asked people if they had some questions or wanted us to talk about anything with Sam Jones, and he I replied with a tweet that he made a couple years ago about Sam Jones stats in Game Sevens. Uh, nineteen fifty nine, nineteen point eight rebounds. Nineteen sixty finals. These are obviously all Game Sevens. Uh, nineteen sixty finals, eighteen points. Sixty two Eastern Division Finals, twenty eight point seven rebounds. Sixty two finals, twenty seven points eight rebounds. Sixty three Eastern Division Finals, forty nine points and seven rebounds. Sixty five Eastern Division Finals, thirty seven points. Sixty six finals, twenty two points five rebounds. 
68 Eastern Division Finals, 22 points, and the 1969 Finals, 24 points, seven rebounds in Game Seven. So no clunkers, you know what I mean? Like no, every no. single one of them was no like yeah. a really good game. And then like yeah, obviously the first two years he's kind of just like you know 19, 18, ah whatever. And then like and that kind of follows his career because by like 1962 he's like a bona fide you know top top tier guy on the Celtics. Yeah, then you get 27 points, 28 points, 47, 37, 22, 22, uh, 24. So yeah, just a. Uh, the real Mr. Clutch. Sorry, Mr. West. Sorry, Logo. But uh, yeah, those, right. that's some pretty big performances there in Game 7. So, Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and Bill Russell wrote in um, Second Win, one of his autobiographies, is, uh, about uh, Sam. His press gave me comfort in key games. In the seventh game of a championship series, I'll take Sam over any player who's walked on a court. So that's saying a lot right there. And, um, yeah, so, you know, he was known, um, you know, one thing was his bank shot. He was just, uh, in fact, um, the original Banksy, right. You got the next thing. It was Banksy cool. From Johnny <laughs> right. Most. Exactly. Yes. Um, and yeah, the bank shot may not have been cool, but it was absolutely, you Oh, know, I effective. thought it was cool. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, yeah. Well, yeah, you, yeah. You and I think it's cool. Yeah. Maybe most people world. do not. Most people right. do not. No, but yeah, he, you know, he used the bank shots. Um, you know, he had extremely high, uh, field goal percentage, uh, for the time. And yeah, he was known, you know, he had an explosive first step. He had great leaping ability, you know, could finish on the break. Um, and, uh, you know, Bob Cousy said, you know, after I was done with my magic, I wanted to put an assist next to my name and Sam hardly ever missed just the, the idea that like, um, you know, he wasn't going to pass it to a guy if he wasn't going to make it. And he trusted Sam to, um, you know, to, to make the shot, especially in the big moment. Uh, also known as a bit of a trash talker. He would sometimes yell too late when he got a shot off, just before a defender could block him, this famously led to an altercation with uh, Will Chamberlain, who Jones just loved to mess with. Um, eventually, Will, you know, got to the point where he was extremely frustrated. He was chasing Sam down. He yelled, "I'm going to kill you if I catch you." Uh, <laughs> Sam Jones runs into the, grabs an empty chair into the baseline, turns and faces Wilt, uh, and then uh, Chamberlain later said in the uh, Terry Pluto book, "Tall Tales," he was about ready to go up into the stands. He didn't want to fight, so I said, "Ah, forget it." So. Um, kind of a, a, a funny moment, but uh, yeah, when he retired, uh, Jones held 11 Celtics records. He was the only player at the time in franchise history to score more than 50 points a game. We're going to get to that in a bit. Um, and yeah, there's some other fun, uh, a few other fun anecdotes about uh, Sam Jones life that we, uh, that we found out. Yeah. So, you know, his, his even getting into the NBA was a bit of a, a struggle for him to even get there. Even getting into college was a bit of a struggle uh, for him to get there. Obviously playing, you know, in the American South at the time that he did, it did not a whole lot of opportunities for a, a, a black basketball player uh, in, in that region. So uh, even to get to college was, was a lot of tough, tough stuff. And we'll talk about that, too. He, you know, historically black colleges and universities pretty much were the only ones that would allow black athletes to go in there. So he wasn't going to play at any big time schools. He wasn't going to play at UNC. He wasn't going to be able to play at all these other places. Uh, so he played at North Carolina Central University. Uh, what, what is now called North Carolina Central University. And uh, halfway through that, he enlists in the Army, uh, stationed in New Mexico, and spends two years there, uh, then returns to uh, start his deg- or complete his degree, I should say, uh, and doesn't end up starting his NBA career until he was 24, which is actually pretty interesting because in that time period, the Lakers actually drafted and tried to claim Sam Jones. But uh, since he was in the Army and he was going to go back to college, uh, they had to let go of that claim. And then obviously... Uh, that leads to this moment where uh, Boston Celtics uh, uh, Red Auerbach, who was pretty good at scouting and pretty good at drafting, I would say. I think that's a bit of a hot take, but I think this man yeah. was was yeah. quite good at selecting yeah. players yeah. for his professional basketball team. Yeah. So especially early on. Yeah. Yes. Six, yeah. Yeah. He was not quite as good, but yeah, but he was good at the trade. So it made yes, it, but, yes, yeah. he was. So, so he uh, yeah. he takes a scouting trip to North Carolina. They had just won the national uh, championship, so he's looking at some UNC Tar Heels and and Bones McKinney. They don't make them like Bones McKinney. I mean, no. nobody's called Bones McKinney anymore. I wish no. we had more Bones McKinneys. Yeah. Walking around, but no more bones. No. Uh, anyway, he uh, he played for Auerbach, uh, uh, and uh, he was coaching at Wake Forest, and he tells Red Auerbach, you know, hey, go to Chapel Hill if you want. Go go look at UNC if you want, but I'm telling you, the best player in the state is at North Carolina Central University, and, and Red's like, ah, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, whatever, yeah. So what happens is, you know, obviously Auerbach's there scouting North Carolina players. The Philadelphia Warriors select Lenny Rosenbluth from North the Carolina. Legendary. Yeah, you don't get enough Lenny Rosenbluths. You don't. Days. Yeah, there's not yeah. a lot of Rosenbluths in the NBA these days. Yeah. So they, they get him with the six pick in the night sure. in, in the '57 draft. So yeah. our back says, ah, f- ah. He s- rips up the draft board. Ah, whatever. Ah, I wanted Rosenbluth. I'm not gonna be able to get him. Whatever. Yeah. Till like Sam Jones two picks later, our back had never seen Jones play. He never went on that recruiting trip, but he said, ah, you know what? Bones says he's good. I trust the guy. Rosenbluth plays two years in the NBA. 
averages 4.2 points per game. Sam Jones played more years in the NBA and averaged more points per game. I yeah. would say just slightly more, slightly, slightly more. more points per game and slightly more years in the NBA. Two years for Rosenbluth, uh, 10 rings for uh, Sam Jones. So I would say yeah. not a bad pick by uh, by Red Auerbach and, and good on Bones McKinney for uh, telling him to make it. So. Yeah, not, not a bad decision at all. Yeah, and um, as you said, yeah, he didn't really – and Sam Jones really – he all he really knew about the Celtics at that point was that they were world champions. He didn't really know you know that much about Bill Russell or Bob Cousy or there. He just was kind of like, and he was not really particularly happy about going to the Celtics because he figured, well, they're an established team. They're you know they just won the championship. They're probably not going to have room for a rookie. I'm not going to have much opportunity there. You know he would rather have gone to the Lakers. Um, and you know in fact he was really even reluctant to go into the league you know he has, his wife had to convince him to, to to actually try out for the team he kind of thought he hadn't but you know, going a little bit back into his background which you, you alluded to yeah he grew up in Laurenburg North Carolina he played high school ball in uh, a small gym that was heated by stoves at each end of the court um, seems dangerous <laughs> but, right. uh, yeah well yeah yeah I mean you know this is life of course in um, the segregated south. Um, and as you mentioned, yeah, he was recruited by historically black colleges, um, North Carolina, uh, what is now North Carolina Central University. Um, and yeah, you know, he had a great NBA career once he got started, but it was a late start. He didn't start until he was 24 years old because of his army, um, you know, uh, stint and going back to college for a senior year. And, um, yeah, but when he retired, he was only one of a dozen players in NBA history at that point who'd lasted until age 35. So, you know, he, he managed to, uh, you have a pretty long career despite starting late. Um, also, you know, he was, he, we've talked about this in, in previous episodes, but he helped lead a revolt of black Celtics players who re- refused to play, uh, an exhibition game after, you know, he and, uh, Satch Sanders have been denied restaurant service in a hotel that, um, you know, the, the, the hotel had grudgingly allowed them to, allowed him to sleep there, but, uh, you know, no restaurant service. So, you know, he and, and Russell and Satch Sanders and the other black players were like, yep, yeah, we're not going to do this. It was supported by Red Arbach. And, um, yeah, you know, I was, I was yeah. reading about that story earlier today. And, and there was one part where they mentioned that, you know, Red was able to talk to the hotel manager and the hotel manager said, okay, yes, they can eat there. They can eat there. And Red says, okay, you guys can eat there. And, and I think it was Sam Jones that said, no, I don't care because tomorrow they're not going to let black guys eat there. So you right. know, let's screw these yeah. guys. We're out of here. Like you know, yeah, yeah they they listen to you because you begged them and you're red hour record. We no, but like tomorrow it's right back to the old story, right back to the old games that they were doing before. So now screw this, we're out. And hey, to Red's credit and everyone's credit, they said screw it, we're done, and they yeah. left. Yeah, absolutely. And that yeah, that took a lot of um, you know courage by um, yeah, it took a lot of courage by uh, Sam Jones and the other guys to um, you know stick to the principles to. Um, uh, to do that, to, you know, took a lot of courage to, um, you know, stand up in the face of that injustice. And, you know, um, it, you know, it was, it was a big moment. So uh, yeah, after his career, um, he coached at uh, Federal City College in downtown Washington, um, returned to North Carolina Central, did some coaching there, uh, worked at um, D.C. public schools for five years, worked at Nike for 10 years, uh, was a Longtime substitute teacher in uh, the Maryland area for um, a long time before I think he moved to Florida later in life. And also uh, did serve briefly in the NBA as an assistant for the New Orleans Jazz in 1975, but did not. Uh, I think he kind of grew apart from the NBA uh, later on in his career. Of course, he you know still was part of the Celtics family, but wasn't uh, wasn't following the NBA closely uh, later on in his career. And um, he did make the Hall of Fame. Although not until 1984, which we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> yeah. get into. We're gonna get right? into that for sure, right? Because I'm just like, okay, what are what are, what are they thinking here? All right, guys, we'll get right back to the Over and Back Classic NBA podcast in a moment. I do have to let you know about a brand new podcast from the Players Tribune. They just launched it. It's their first ever mental health podcast. It's called Blindsided. It's hosted by former NHL goalie Corey Hirsch and psychiatrist Dr. Diane McIntosh. The show will share the moments for a variety of athletes when everything changed for them and mental health became the most important focus of their lives. Guests this season include, relevant to you guys, Kevin Love, uh, Kurt Warner, and many, many others. Again, it's hosted by former NHL goalie Corey Hirsch and psychiatrist Dr. Diane McIntosh. Blindsided dives in deeper, it gets clinical, and allows listeners to leave with an understanding of the different varieties of mental health challenges that people face, why they appear, and how athletes in particular 
face them down. Blindsided is a sports podcast, not only for people who follow sports, but also for those who don't. Again, the podcast is called Blindsided. It is hosted by the Player uh, Players Tribune for Several Mental Health Podcasts, hosted by Corey Hirsch and Dr. Diane McIntosh. Listen to it wherever podcasts are listened to. We're going to break down 10 games that we feel define Sam Jones' career. Yeah, let, let, let's do that. So we'll have some here that are, are just, you know, important games, big time games, you know, statistically important games, you know, just, just a, a collection of 10 games that we think sure. uh, very quickly define uh, Sam Jones' career. The first one I'm going to do here is October 25th, 1958. This is the first 20 point game of Sam Jones's career. And that kind of alludes to something you talked about earlier, that Sam Jones was not an immediate success. And uh, he was behind, you know, obviously Bob Cousy and Bill Sharman. So it's tough to get minutes when you're a rookie and Bob Cousy and Bill Sharman are in front of you. Uh, and yeah, he wasn't, you know, like you said, it wasn't even certain that he wanted that he was going to join the Celtics. He was fine going into teaching. His wife, Gladys says, no, try it out, try it out, try it out. And yeah, his rookie year, he was fine. Like he was okay, but you know, he failed to score in double figures 49 times his rookie year. He was a real, a pretty much a non factor uh, for the 58 Celtics. He ends the season averaging just 4.6 points per game. Not far off from our boy Lonnie uh, uh, Rosenbluth or whatever right. uh, there, yeah. but. Um, Advantage yeah. Rosenbluth. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And then uh, yeah. only 10.6 minutes per game as well. So, yeah, it was really tough. And he, he, the quote here says, I'm a team player and I was trying to find my role. I didn't like starting at first. I liked coming off the bench. The reason was that I could come in fresh and run and shoot and get out on the fast break. I had an advantage. When I started, I didn't have that advantage. So he tried to look at, at, at the, the most of it of, of coming off the bench that first year, really not playing uh, very much. But uh, this game, the, the reason why I mentioned this game, this October 25th, uh, 1958, is this, to me, was the next year. This is the beginning of his sophomore year. And this really signifies, to me, his ascension on the team. Because, yeah, th- they lost this game. That's irrelevant. They, they, they lost this game. But what was important, though, is that he got his first 20-point game ever. And he was off to the races. Because this next sophomore year, he raised his scoring average up to 10.7 points per game. And more importantly, he doubles his minutes per game year over year uh, to 20.6. And I think what's most important about this 20-point game is it let the Celtics know, hey, now we can go back to winning titles. Because they uh, had lost the year prior that <laughs> uh, you know yeah. they don't play Sam Jones enough. And then they lose to the St. Louis Hawks. But this year, they say, ah, you know what? Let's play this guy a little bit more. Uh, and they end up winning uh, the championship. Jones had scored 20 plus points five more times that season, uh, plus one time in the postseason to help the Celtics beat, drum roll please, the Lakers to win the title. Uh, Jones, he would average just under 10 points per game in the finals. And this would probably be pretty much be the last finals or last playoffs where he doesn't play like an integral role uh, in the Celtics. But but at least it, to me, it signified like the beginning of them really, really trusting this guy and, and, and realizing what they had uh, in, in Sam Jones, which... Um, Leads me to a few uh, seasons later, uh, March 12th, 1961, the first 40 point game of uh, Sam Jones's career, uh, only a second 30 plus point game in his career. We talked about the other one, uh, and then uh, he did that in his fourth season. Uh, and then he started getting big minutes at, at this point, and he would take over as a full time starter in 1962. So he said it took a little while, and that's again, like we say, that's probably why he didn't really want to go to the Celtics is, is he's looking at that and going, you know, shit, you know, he could say, oh, I didn't really want to start, I didn't want to do this, but like you could see how as a rookie, like, he could have easily, very, very easily, Boston could have just said, hey, we don't really need this guy and cut him after that first year. I mean, he wasn't that important to the Celtics that first season, but it, but to their credit, they stuck with him, and he ends up becoming a full-time starter by 1962. Uh, but this is his first 40-point game. He'd score 40-plus uh, points eight more times in his career, four of those in playoff games as well. Uh, and then from 1961 to 1969, he'd averaged 20.2 points per game, five rebounds per game, 2.9 assists per game, uh, and... Uh, that includes his mid thirties as well. So this is a guy who right. was pretty much good until the final days of his career, which we'll talk about again. We'll talk about his final game where he still is putting up big numbers and still going out there and beating the Lakers. But uh, yeah, first forty point game for him in March twelfth, nineteen sixty one. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, if this had been like if he had just been a few years later, you know he he joins the league, you know as as they start expanding. Yeah, there's no way he's going to last with the Celtics. I mean, they're, they're going to at some point have to make a decision to like cut him in the expansion draft. If it happens like in the first or second season of his career, he's probably not going to be able to um, stick around there. He, you know, he would have ended up on another team or whatever. And obviously, you know, in an in era where there's free agency or something, that that would have been a really hard team. Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, there's no way you would be able to keep Casey Jones and Sam Jones behind Bill Sharman and uh, Bob Cousy for four years. There's just no way that would have, you know. Uh, uh, there's no way that would have been able to happen. So, yeah. um, 
Yeah, and in some ways, yeah, maybe, again, Sam Jones on another team being like the guy, maybe he's seen somewhere along, you know, somewhere close to where, you know, you would see Jerry West or uh, somebody like that. But obviously, you know, the, the situation with the Celtics worked out pretty well for him, too. I would say, yeah, I would say yeah. it did, did okay. Yes. So 1962 Eastern Division Finals, Game 7, we've got a uh, we've, we've got a thriller here against the um, – excuse me, yes, against the Philadelphia Warriors, April 5th, 1962. Um, and, uh, yes, the the Celtics win this game thanks to Mr. Clutch, uh, described in a Boston Globe article as Silent Sam Jones, dispelling once and for all the characteristic of timidity in the clutch. Silent Sam Jones came through with a 15 foot jump shot with two seconds remaining to give the Celtics a one Oh nine one Oh seven victory. Uh, this was in Boston. Um, and of course, uh, gave the Lakers the right to, uh, or excuse me, the Celtics, the right to face the Lakers in the 1962 finals. Um, Bill Russell later called this the toughest series I ever had to play in, you know, the, uh, the 62 Warriors, they've got Will Chamberlain, of course. They've got Thomas Sherry. They've got Guy Rogers, Paul Arizon, Tom Gola, Al Adels. You know, tough team there uh, with the Warriors. But, um, but, but yeah, the, uh, the Celtics pull it out again, keep that legendary magic. And, um, and Sam Jones in this game, plus in addition to hitting the game winner, has 28 points, seven rebounds, showing those game seven bona fides. And um, yeah, he also did pretty well in game five of this series as well. 23 points, 18 rebounds, seven assists. So he's just absolutely essential. And again, as we said, this is the Celtics first season of that dynasty without Bill Sharman. Sam Jones now entrenched as a starter, mm-hmm. you know, now playing full starters minutes um, and, you know, absolutely becoming, uh, you know, an essential ingredient for the rest of that Celtics dynasty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, 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 no fall off. No, uh, you know, hey, we lose uh, an all time great a Hall of Famer. Right. And yeah, we just yeah. insert another guy who is ascending into an all time great Hall of Famer right there. So, yeah, not, not, nice embarrassment of riches there for the Celtics. So good for that. Yeah, absolutely. So and then, yeah, we then we move on to still 1962, the NBA Finals Game Six and the Celtics. They, they were in a tough position here. They were down three two to the Lakers. Elgin Baylor had just scored 61 points in Game Five in Boston. But they're they're back to LA, and then Sam Jones comes through huge, thirty five points, seven rebounds, three assists, helping the Celtics uh, win one nineteen one hundred five, tying the series at three to three, sending it to Game Seven in Boston, and you know Jones does pretty good in Game Seven too. Uh, of course, Bill Russell has 30 points and 40 rebounds in the game. It's a 110 or excuse me, 110, 107 overtime victory for Boston. Jones starts really slow in the first half. He only has two points. He's one for 10 from the field, but in the second half uh, and overtime, 25 points uh, scores um, five of the Celtics, 10 points in overtime ends up with 35 points. Um, total just absolutely um, delivers huge in that game, uh, helping the uh, helping the Celtics uh, Celtics win that game. Excuse me, I had the uh, I had the the box score. Uh, I, I had the the totals wrong for that game. He ended up with twenty seven points in that game in in, in game seven of that series, um, eight rebounds, uh, three assists, and uh, but but still the the message is clear. He absolutely uh, big again in a game seven. Absolutely, yeah. It's an all-time great series as well, that 1962 Finals and that, that sure. Game 7, too. I mean, that is just a t- juggernaut versus juggernaut. Yeah, Bill Russell, as you said, 30 points, 40 rebounds. Sam Jones, 27 points, 25 in the uh, uh, second half. Jerry West puts 35 up. Elgin Baylor, 41 and 22 rebounds. Right. And right. they still lose. It's just like, damn it. Come hey, on. <laughs> how, how, Howie, Howie Jolif for the Lakers gets two rebounds in nine minutes. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It was yeah. a Ray, Ray Felix. Um, no, he, yeah, he, gets, he scores two points. Yeah. It's two free throws, two clutch free throws. That, uh, two absolute yeah. clutch free throws. Yeah. <laughs> but no, just juggernauts. I mean, this is an awesome series. This is an all time yeah. great series. And there's going to be a lot of these. That's one of the benefits to the Celtics is they were awesome, but they weren't awesome enough that, like, 
every game and every series goes like six or seven games and it leads they to these dramatic. awesome moments. Like right. I'm glad because it'd be kind of boring if they just like swept everybody. It's not like right. the Durant, you know, Curry <laughs> Warriors sure. that are just like, ah, these are boring. Come on. These right. guys are, it's like, you know, they're great and they're always going to win these titles, but they're always going to make it really, really interesting, which I always right. appreciated. So that is nice. Yes. Agreed. So, so we, Next, we have uh, we've got the 1963 Eastern Division Finals. Another game seven. Sam Jones dueling with Oscar Robertson. Sam Jones wins that duel, 47 points, seven rebounds. Uh, Oscar Robertson with uh, 43 points, and um, the the Celtics are able to pull out a, a, a tough series against the uh, Cincinnati Royals. This is probably the Royals' best chance at. Um, dethroning the uh, Celtics, but unfortunately for the Royals, they, they fall short. Uh, Jones is 47 points were the most scored in a game seven in NBA playoff history. Although Dominique Wilkins did tie that in 88. And then Kevin Durant finally broke the record last season, 2021 in the Eastern conference uh, semis against the Bucks. Although Durant did need overtime to, uh, to break that record. So mm. Sam does. Yeah. So I don't know, Katie. Yeah. <laughs> overtime. I don't yeah. Know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if only he just, if only he just stepped back, uh, you know, one, uh, one inch and didn't have his foot on the line. Oh, right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. He ruined, yeah. yeah he ruined so many things. He ruined the Nets uh, potential title. He ruined this. Yeah record yeah all right way yeah, to go, how dare he? yeah way to go that toenail <laughs> if only his yeah. toe was a little shorter so right yeah um and then yeah in in the 63 finals he continues to deliver 24.7 points on 45 percent shooting 7.3 rebounds 3.2 assists um and that for that postseason overall uh 23.8 points 83 uh, percent shooting 54 true shooting 6.2 rebounds 2.5 assists just some some huge numbers during those those uh, early postseasons really um you know delivering big um as the uh, as the top scorer first team but you know they really need scoring at this point i mean um you know tom heinson and bob Cousy, you know we're both kind of getting up there you know those are kind of the two guys they you know were kind of tr- trusting to you know do most of the scoring in these situations or at least you know kind of get the ball and try to um make something happen although the you know the celtics were not really a half court team generally they were going to be you know uh, get the rebound get the fast break you know just kind of get somebody the ball they didn't have a lot of set plays but still you know they the guys who were they were expecting to shoulder most of the load in scoring were either gone or were um, getting older. And Sam Jones absolutely was, you know, the, the key guy um, during this period while, you know, Havlicek was developing and while they would, you know, kind of get some of the guys that, um, you know, they would get later, like, you know, your, your Don Nelson's and, um, and such that, you know, to, um, to kind of get that scoring load, but he was absolutely, you know, especially essential during this period. Yeah, yeah, this is a, an interesting kind of a transition period for the Celtics, where, like you said, yeah, you, you're getting Russell, who's who's still great, but he's starting to kind of take on less of a scoring load and sure. just kind of be the, hey, I'm going to get rebounds and right. get it to you guys, and you guys do everything. Bob Cousy really getting up there in age and 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 almost you know near the end of his career. Tom right. Heinsohn, as you said, getting up there, and yeah, you can look at the roster and go, well, they have John Havlicek, but it's like, yeah, similar to Sam Jones, when they bring Havlicek in there, there's a lot of dudes that he's in front of, and he's not quite quite ready yet he's not quite the John Havlicek that we know from the sure. late 60s early 70s or whatever so he's kind of still developing and getting there so yes yeah, Sam Jones is an essential piece of this kind of transition period and that it speaks to Sam Jones and his impact as well that like you said he played a, a huge huge role in kind of the quote-unquote old Celtics and then also will play a huge role in the new Celtics while also shouldering the load in between that period between the uh, time between those two uh, uh, great teams so yeah it's just a, right. a, an essential part of this in between period for for the uh, for the Celtics. Right. And yeah, and obviously, as you know, Bill Russell was never going to be expected to be the guy. Oh, God, no, no. Take the last shot and, and create offense. You know, that wasn't what he was. I mean, he was one of the greatest players in NBA history, despite all that for everything else. But that was not going to be his forte. And Sam Jones was one of the guys who that was his forte. And that's, you know, and, and that was what he contributed to, um, you know, those great teams. Uh, and another example of that 1965 Eastern Division Finals Game Seven. And this is Havlicek steals the ball. Well, Havlicek did steal the ball, but Sam Jones scored 37 points um, to uh, lead uh, all scorers in uh, this game. The Celtics against the Philadelphia 76ers. Another um, another Game Seven. And then you know this entire postseason, uh, Jones averages 28.6 uh, points per game, which is his um, career playoff high. Um, 4.6 rebounds, 2.5 assists. Uh, Average 29.1 points per game during the series. Um, And uh, according to the uh, Sarasota Herald Tribune, 
It was a repeat starring role for Sam Jones. Three years ago, Archer shot over Chamberlain's fingertips to beat the Philadelphia Warriors with two seconds left. Of course, his game winner that we already talked about. Um, and in the finals, uh, Jones averaged team high 27.8 points per game, uh, 4.8 rebounds, 2.6 assists. Uh, these numbers all coming from um, the Basketball Scholar um, article that we alluded to earlier, which has you know some great um, numbers and uh, items uh, that you're talking about Sam Jones' delivery in the clutch. Absolutely. All right. What do we got next? All right. 51 points for uh, Sam Jones here. October 29th, 1965 this is the first uh, time in his career that he is going to score 50 points. Not the last, though. Uh, and in a non-Wilt world, 50 points is still pretty tough to get. Yes, Will Chamberlain did it <laughs> way too many times the list. But uh, other than non-Wilt, if we take Wilt out of it, uh, 50 point games before Sam Jones or did it. Uh, Elgin Baylor, Joel Folks. Jerry West, George Mikan, Richie Guerin, Cliff Hagan, Bob Pettit, Oscar Robinson, Jack Twyman, Hal Greer, Rio LaRusso, Dolph Shays, George Yardley. That's it. That's the entire list. And that's like the who's who uh, of top, top tier scores in NBA history up yeah. to this point, up until 1965. Non well, division, I, obviously. <laughs> and Rio LaRusso. But, uh, yeah, well, uh, and Rio LaRusso's there too. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, yes. hey, yes. Yeah. Everyone has a good, sometimes guys just have a good night. You know what I mean? Sure. You're just going to sure. yeah. uh, do it. But uh, yeah, so, so Jones gets 50. But I thought what was more interesting is, is where the Celtics were at this time. So Boston had cruised to an NBA title uh, the year prior, defeating, drum roll please, the Lakers in five games. But uh, as the uh, 64-65 season started, though, the Celtics are struggling a little bit. Yes, they're two and three, and most teams, that's not struggling. But for the Celtics, that's kind of struggling. The year prior, they hadn't had their second loss until like mid-November. So this is a team that at this time is 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 meant to be winning every title, meant to be the top top tier team. And and at this point, they're 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 scudding, you know, and they lose to the Pistons in this game. He scored fifty one, and they lose uh, to the Pistons. But uh, yeah, he does this on twenty one of thirty five shooting, a perfect nine and nine from the floor. Boston lost to the Pistons, as I said, um, but uh, Detroit at this time they were a thirty one win. Uh, team uh, the year prior. Uh, the fortunes for both teams would change uh, pretty drastically after this game as well. Uh, Boston, I think, gets back on track here. They would go 12-2 and two over their next 14 games en route to uh, you know winning 45 games. And another title beating, Jason, one guess of who they beat in seven games in the NBA Finals. Uh, Charlotte Bobcats. Cl- mm, close. Yeah, it, was the La- no. it was the Lakers again. Yeah, ah, it was. Okay. Unfortunately, okay. it was Mr. Clutch and the Lakers yet again. Um so Sam Jones single-handedly turns around this Boston season and single-handedly destroys the up-and-coming Detroit Pistons because they would lose 11 in the next 12 games and end the season with only 22 wins. So, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe you don't make your, uh, you know, like your 24-year-old best player the coach as well. Maybe that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah, I forget we yeah. should have mentioned there that they were coached by Dave DeBusher, who right. uh, was like 10 years younger than most of the other guys on the team. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> it didn't, uh, you right. know, hey. <laughs> I'm not against it, but it uh, didn't seem to work very well at all in any way, yeah. shape, or form whatsoever. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. So um, we, and then you, of course, you know, Sam Jones scores 51 for the first time. Well, he did it again in the postseason, 1967 Eastern Division fine semis, game four. It's the siding game. It's the Celtics taking on the New York Knicks. The first time the Knicks had made the playoffs since 1959. So it's been a long time. You got Willis Reed. You got you got Walt Bellamy. Um, you got Cassie Russell. You got uh, Dick Van Arsdale. Uh, you know, pretty good, pretty solid team. You know, but uh, yeah, even though the Boston Celtics, you know, they're aging a bit here. Um, this, I believe, '67 was the first year they didn't actually win their division. They they lose it to the, to the Sixers. Bombs. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, yeah, they they still uh, deliver in the playoffs. Sam Jones. 51 points, 19 of 30 from the field. Man. 13 of 17 from the line, also had four rebounds. Um, and uh, he also had a 38-point game uh, during this uh, series as well. So, you know, helping the uh, helping the Celtics out, delivering that big uh, scoring punch. Uh, they're going to they're, they're gonna make the uh, next round where the dynasty is finally going to, uh, you know, the eight titles in a row finally going to end this year against the uh, 76ers. But, um you know, Sam keeps him alive for a little while and then is going to deliver big in the last a couple seasons as well for those uh, final two Celtics titles. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you want to uh, uh, I, I can do this 1969 NBA sure. finals game four, another classic NBA finals matchup between the uh, the Celtics uh, and the Lakers. 
Uh, Los Angeles 69 finals. They win the first two games, 120, 118, and then 118, 112. Uh, Jerry West in game one. He's like, I'm sick of this shit. I'm winning this. 53 points and 10 assists in game one. 41 points in game two. He's mad as hell and he's not going to take it anymore. Uh, But Boston comes back 111-105 to win the third game. And they trail the fourth game 88-87 to with seven seconds left. Boston looking at going down 3-1. Nah, Jones hits a game winner to give Boston a one-point win to tie the series at 2-2. Uh, Jones did call a shot at the beginning of the year as well, saying that he is done at, at year's end. This is going to be his last NBA season. Um, you know, as we mentioned here, that uh, you know they're going to win by one. Uh, LA, they have a one-point lead with seven seconds left, 88-87. Uh, Elgin Baylor steps out of bounds. Uncharacteristic mistake from Elgin Baylor there. Gives right. Boston one more chance. Boston runs a play called Ohio. It's a uh, staggered triple screen for Jones, who nails the shot at the buzzer, evens the series at two games apiece. He has 16 points, four rebounds, and four assists in the game. Keeps the Celtics alive, which eases us perfectly into the NBA's finals. Game 7, 1969, a storybook ending to Sam Jones' career. It's Game 7. It's the NBA Finals. The Celtics win. He wins a ring. They beat Jason. Who do they beat? They beat... You got this. You can do this. I promise. Yeah. You can do it. Um, they used to be in Minnesota, but now okay. they're in another Ooh. town. <laughs> oh, okay. Not the Timberwolves then. It's um, not the North Stars. It's not the North no. Dallas Stars. This is basketball no. we're talking about here. Yeah. Okay, basketball. Yeah, professional basketball. Okay. All right. I got this. It's the uh, the Pittsburgh Pipers. <sighs> Damn. No? No. The Lakers. It was the Lakers, Lakers again. Oh, yeah, it was the Lakers man. again, believe it or not. Oh, so. Gosh. Yeah, this is the famous game where Lakers owner Jack Kent Cook was well prepared for a Lakers championship. He sure. he fills the arena with balloons that say World Champion Lakers. Every seat in the arena has a flyer that says, quote, when, not if, the Lakers win the title. Balloons will be released from the rafters. The USC marching band will play Happy Days Are Here Again. And prog- uh, broadcaster Chick Hearn will interview Elgin Baylor, Jerry West, and Wilt Chamberlain in that order. That leads us to the famous Bill Russell quote, an all-time great quote that says, those fucking balloons are staying up there, <laughs> which is just, oh, man. I would love to get I might just get a, a poster that just says that. That's a, just an all-time great. Uh, I don't even yeah. like the Celtics. You know what I mean? Like, that's but a great that's, inspirational. Yeah, that's it's like, that's, so good. Yeah, that's, that's better than the cat, you know, hang in there. That's, yeah, that's exactly. Better. Those yeah. fucking balloons right. are staying up there. It's just right. the best. Yeah. So, all right. uh, Celtics blow the doors off the Lakers at the beginning. They go up big early. This leads to the famous benching of Wilt Chamberlain, who who goes out with an injury. Then he says he's ready to come back. Uh, Lakers coach uh, uh, Van Brennikoff says, no, nah, we're good. We don't need you anymore. We're doing just fine without you. Um, the Lakers do make a, a miraculous comeback here. Get it, get it pretty close. Don Nelson hits a big shot, a very famous shot that bounces like literally 15 feet up. And it hits the rim, <laughs> bounces like 95 feet into the air, hits the top of the air, hits those balloons. Yeah. It hits yeah. the balloons and then comes it right back balloons. down. Right, so yeah. If he didn't have the balloons in there, it would have just hit the rafters and it would have been right. a dead ball. But no, nope, he had to put yeah. a bunch of balloons up there. So exactly. the Don Nelson shot hits yeah. the balloons, comes right down. It, 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 Don Nelson could take that shot 10,000 more times in his life, and I don't think it's yeah. going to go in the way it went in. I mean, it's just – there's clips of it too, and it's just ridiculous. It just shoots right in the air, yeah. and you're like, well, that's never going in. <laughs> just yeah. okay. wham, right down. Right. Just makes it. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the Lakers had lost – once again, Jones finishes right. his career on top. Great performance in a huge spot, scoring 24 points on 10 of 16 shooting, seven rebounds, uh, an amazing way to go. Uh, unfortunately, as was customary throughout his career, Jones says, hey, I'm retiring. I'm done. That's it for me. Uh, you know who also retires that year? Bill Russell. And yeah. uh, turns out more people cared about Bill Russell retiring than they cared about Sam Jones retiring. So, again, just a perfect, sure. perfect way to cap off the Sam Jones career. Game seven, NBA Finals. His Celtics win the title. The Lakers lose, and then he's overshadowed immediately by another one of his teammates. So, yeah, I, I think he still accepted the 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 the, the way it happens. Oh no, uh, no, yeah, he he will yeah. definitely be fine with having two full handfuls of, of rings. Getting that tenth yes, ring is is, is pretty exactly. impressive. So, absolutely, yeah. So, I want to go back to this Hall of Fame thing. So. He's not in. He you know he retires end of the sixty nine season. Obviously, as we said, um, his first year he is eligible is nineteen seventy five. So I wanted to get into. And I'm just gonna we're just gonna talk about guys who were NBA related Hall of Fame. Sure, no no real no real point to this at all. You're just you know naming not, not guys, even, just saying but, guys. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Well, not not well. I, I I'm not <laughs> even gonna get into like people from you know college basketball or other things. It just we'll just talk about the NBA guys because. Um, 
So, yeah, so 1975, Bill Russell goes in. Now, Bill Russell basically goes in under protest. He doesn't want anything to do with the Hall of Fame. He says, hey, this is a racist institution. Don't induct me. You know, um, I'm not into this. Uh, and But they induct him. Well, they, they at least put him in. You know, the, 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 probably a little weird at the ceremony. But um, but they do put him in. Um, and uh, But they don't put in Sam Jones. Um, 76, they put in Tom Gola and Bill Sharman. Uh, long waits for both guys. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I would definitely would not put in Tom Gola before Sam Jones, Bill Sharman, and eh, you could kind of make a case for it. I mean, he was one of the um, certainly one of the one of the top two or three shooting guards of his time. So you know, and of course, part of that Celtics dynasty, although not as big a part of his Jones was. So seventy seven, Elgin Baylor, sure, Elgin Baylor makes sense. Seventy eight, um, they decide, hey, we're going to throw in some guys: Paul Arizon, Joe Folks, Cliff Hagen, Jim Pollard. Uh, out of those four guys, I would maybe would put Arizon in before Sam Jones, but the rest of those guys probably not. What do you think? I would agree. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Arizon, I, I have no uh, huge uh, yeah. ar- argument with. Uh, Folks yeah. Hagen and, and, and especially Jim Pollard. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Jones got to go before those guys. Now, now, you know, well, Folks, he, he died in 76, so it's was posthumous. But, you know, I mean, you know, both of those guys have been waiting a long time. Arizon's been waiting, waiting a long time. Um, so I get that. But not, not, but still. Yeah, that's uh, remember when the, uh, the basketball hall of fame used to like really take their time with guys, and now it's like you can't even believe there's like dudes who go in now. You're like, Yeah, I didn't yeah. even realize he was retired for the amount of years that was required, right? Like, yeah, like, well, like we got to get Chris Bosch, and it's been too long. It's like, you guys just retired like two years ago, like, let's calm down a little bit. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and this is like, well, Joel folks died, I guess we can finally put him in now. It's like the baseball hall of fame. I, I uh, right. in some way, I kind of appreciate it because I enjoy you know, I, I like you know, a, a, a hall of fame really truly feeling like it's the best of the best but uh yeah it's it's pretty wild given where the basketball hall of fame is, is gone these days we're just like 45 guys going every single year now so. it's just so weirdly inconsistent you know that's that's the thing that like we so got to get mitch richmond in it's like no we, we do we though i mean like i like mitch but i don't know that yeah. we need mitch richmond in the basketball hall right. of fame like. um anyway so so 1980 we got jerry west oscar robertson okay yeah both those yeah. Jerry lucas uh, you gonna put jerry Yay. lucas in before uh before you're gonna put in sam jones I don't this know. is 19 we're talking 1980 by the way we're talking and they're right. still just like i don't know about this jones yeah. guy <laughs> and, and jerry lucas was like that was that was probably his first year he was eligible too right like, oh yeah yeah I, right, I, mean, right, I, I know, right i mean i know he was a great college player but um, yeah that's it, always like, a part like of it of, I like guess. one of the best college players ever but uh, i'm just kind of like eh, i don't know and then they put in Les Harrison, who was, um, you know, was the Royals coach, GM, and owner. He put him in as a contributor. Um, but yeah, um, 1981 Walter Kennedy, <laughs> like, the 1981 <laughs> Hall of Fame classes. That, that is a uh, that, that's just Walter Kennedy. Yeah, the only person who well, belonged in the Hall of Fame, Walter Kennedy. Right, <laughs> the only NBA guy who. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, see if I can pull up that list after we're done with this because I'm <laughs> I, I'm very interested in the 1981 class. 1982. We get Hal Greer, um, Slater Martin, Frank Ramsey, and Willis Reed. Um, <laughs> Willis Reed, come on! Well, I, mean, <laughs> I like okay. Willis. He's fine. Willis Reed, won, Willis Reed won an MVP, so I, I'm he can I'm wait kinda, a couple years. <laughs> He's just I, I, retired. I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna kind of give you that. Like Frank Ramsey ahead of I mean Frank Ramsey was great and he'd been waiting longer, but like uh, you know ahead of Sam Jones. Um, you know, Slater Martin. I mean, come on, how career basically contemporary um, and about as good as Sam Jones. Um, and so, uh, but obviously not as, as many team accomplishments. So uh, Will Street's the only one of that of those guys from like, Oh yeah, I, I guess you can put him ahead of um, Sam Jones, but actually 83 Bill Bradley, <laughs> <laughs> Dave the Busher and Jack Twyman. I mean, what are we doing here? I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> Did Bradley give them like some sort of grant, or was, was he? Because uh, he was I mean, was he in public office at this point he yet? Was, so he was senator, I think it was not long after he was elected elected senator. So okay, um, yeah, like they wanted. Years after that. So, yeah, apparently they want the prestige of that. I don't know <laughs> prestige of some sort of grant or something. Even though um, I don't think he would have been in their, that jurisdiction whatsoever. But uh, yeah, you know, yeah, some some sort of uh, right wanted to grease the uh, <laughs> grease the wheel a little bit, I guess, for a future political uh, uh, benefit. So. Finally, in 84, well, they got to put John Havlicek in because, you know, this was his first year out They're like, oh, yeah, well, it's kind of embarrassment that we put Sam Jones in yet, so let's just go ahead and do that now. So Now, is this something, because I I, I I participate in the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame uh, as sure. well, and, and a couple years ago, uh, Dave Meltzer realized he did not put Jimmy Hart in. He always kind of assumed that he put Jimmy Hart in, and someone <laughs> said, hey, you know, Jimmy Hart's not in. He went, holy shit, Jimmy Hart's not in. He just put him in because he was like, oh, crap, I'm not even going to put it up to 
to vote. Like, what the hell? Why is Jimmy Hart not in the Hall of Fame? So uh, is it possible that they did this? They called Havlicek and they're like, hey, congratulations on being in the Hall of Fame. And he's like, yeah. he's like, why is Sam Jones not? And they're like, oh, no, he's in. And they're like, and he's like, no, he's not. And they're like, oh, God, whoops. Why did we put him in? Yeah, we maybe. put Bill Bradley in? We didn't put Sam Jones in? I'm sorry. Oh, God. Yeah, invite him. Please, please, please. That's what I'm assuming happened. I don't know anything about it. I don't, I'm not going right. to do any research on it. But I'd imagine yeah. the uh, the fine folks at the, uh, the Naismith uh, Hall of Fame decided, oh, crap, we thought we put Sam Jones in in like 1977. We didn't? Oh, crap. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have him, have him come. Have him come. Yeah. So I am looking up. So the 1981 uh, class of the Hall of Fame, uh, in addition to Walter Kennedy, we also have Thomas Barlow, who is a player. Um, I'm looking up Thomas Barlow right now to see if I can get any information about Yeah, he probably scored like 40,000 points in high school uh-huh. in Iowa or some shit like that. So. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, all right. The – Ferenc Hep as a contributor, Walter Kennedy as mentioned, and then Arid McCutcheon as a coach. Okay, so yeah, we have big, big attendance here. <laughs> I guess they really... <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. So uh, Arid McCutcheon, he was uh, he coached his hometown University of Ev- Evansville from 1946 to 1977, guiding the Purple Aces to a 514-314 record. Okay, so, eh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he they won five. They won five championships um, in whatever division they were in. Uh, and uh, let's see what. Um, oh, Division Two championships. So okay, well, you know, interesting. Anyway, um, let's see. Doctor Ferenc Kemp. He was considered the father of Hungarian basketball. Was a member of right. the uh, Fieber Central Board in the 1950s and 1960s. Was the president of the Hungarian Basketball Federation. And uh, Thomas Barlow, he played. Um, oh, he, he was with the uh, the Spas and the uh, fi- the original Philadelphia Warriors of the um, ABL from the. So he played in the twenties uh, and thirties, basically. So anyway, um, none of those guys I would put ahead of Sam Jones. No, but, I mean, yeah, maybe maybe, you know, maybe, I, the, maybe the Godfather of Hungarian basketball I put in front of Sam Jones because you know it's maybe yeah, Hungary, I mean, the, the great uh, basketball tradition they, of Hungary. They, so they uh, were, I mean, they were hungry for somebody to get into the uh, uh, whole thing. So. <laughs> Thank you, Rich. I appreciate Boo. that. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so so now we know. So I like this series. So our next show, uh, tune in for our next show where we bury everybody that's in the Basketball Hall of Fame and why they don't deserve to be in there. So uh, yes. we'll make our own yes. Basketball Hall of Fame where it will basically only be like 45 guys and most of these other right. dudes are out of here. So right. sorry, yeah. high school basketball coaches of Missouri, you're out. So you're out. Uh, you're yeah. gone. All of, about you. It. All of yes. you are out. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, oh, apparently, okay, Eric McCutcheon, um, his first name was inherited from a grandfather who was named from the Bible. He often said the name was Hebrew for wild ass. Okay. Square to Wikipedia, yeah. Great. <laughs> he also he also lived in Santa Claus, Indiana for some time. Oh, so, I uh, yeah. have not been there, but I've heard of Santa Claus, Indiana. So Sure. Well, um, it is a notable name, yeah. So, anyway. I think Jay Cutler, I believe. Uh, Ah. Former pro football star Jay Cutler is from uh, Santa Claus, Indiana. Let me confirm wow. that. Yes, he indeed he is from Santa Claus, Indiana. So. All right. Did Jay Cutler make the Hall of Fame before Sam Jones? Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not far off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't enough. actually not know if uh, he uh, if Jay Cutler has made the the football. I don't follow no, the uh, the football not. Hall of Fame yeah, at all. So. I don't think he's good enough to make that uh, Hall of Fame. But anyway, nevertheless. Um, all right. Well, uh, this has been fun. Uh, always, uh, you know, these, these these shows tend to be uh, enjoyable to look back at uh, players' careers, even though obviously um, it's a, a sad time for losing another NBA great. But it's a uh, but it's been enjoyable to uh, talk about his legacy. Hopefully, uh, I, I learned some things here. Hopefully, everyone uh, got a chance to uh, learn learn a bit here. But uh, but thanks everyone for checking us out. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook. Both of them are at Over and Back NBA. You can listen to us on pretty much any pl- platform in which podcasts are played. If you uh, want to leave us a rating and a review on any of those platforms, we would greatly appreciate it. So thanks again for listening. We'll be back again soon.